welcome. I'm Lois Knight. I'm the Learning Support Manager and the Head of Inclusion at the College. And um, Today we're going to be talking with one of our guest speakers, who is Chris Jay. Welcome, Chris. He joins us from Florida, I think, at the moment. Yes. Um, thanks to COVID, I've been out here rather longer than I was expecting to be. Good. Uh, well, good day, everyone, since I don't know what time this is going to go out. And Chris is going to be talking to us about his journey into employment, where he started, where he's got to, and just give us some insight. And we're really, really grateful, Chris. So thank you for your time. I guess let's just kick off. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris? And what was your first job? How did you get into employment? And what are you doing now? OK, so uh, my name is Chris Jay. I'm 35 years old. Yes, I know that makes me old compared to most of the people watching this. I was born with cerebral palsy and I've been a wheelchair user for the last 20 something years. Um, I went to a state school with a special support unit attached to it. So I was able to get support in areas like science where they felt understandably that um, someone with a disability shouldn't be handling acids and alkalis. They thought that was probably a bad idea and I might burn the school down. Um, in terms of my primary school, I actually went to an independent school because back in 1990, it was the only school uh, that was prepared to accept a child with a physical disability. So although today we are going to talk about some barriers to getting into employment, I think it's also really important to recognise how far we've come and actually how much better the situation is for perhaps today's young people than it was when I was much, much younger. So um, I run an organisation called Bascule Disability Training. Uh, and what that does really, it's a social enterprise. It does disability awareness training for businesses, looking at appropriate language, legislation, communication techniques, and how to create inclusive work environments. And then it spends 75% of the profit doing free workshops for school children. The name of Bascule is a kind of drawbridge. So 67% of the British population feel uncomfortable talking to people with disabilities. According to Scope, my job is to bring the bridge back down. Um, reasonable adjustment is also in law as what people have to do for people with disabilities in the workplace. And bascule also means balance in French. It's also a form of medieval torture device, but hopefully we're not going to get too close to that today. Uh, now you've seen the wheelchair, I'm going to move a little bit closer. So how did I get into this field? Um, I was very conscious that when I was young and at school and college, I used to hear all these stories about how people fell into the kind of work that they do. And I used to think that was a load of old rubbish. Unfortunately, it's also true. So I went to university. I have a degree in politics and a master's degree in global security. And whilst I was doing that, a friend of mine phoned me and said, hey, I'm doing this amazing voluntary work with an organization going into schools, talking to kids about what it's like to have a disability. And that was actually the forerunner to the organization I run now. So over the course of the next 10 years, I went from a volunteer within that organization to being chairman and then executive chairman of the organization and running it until it closed in July 2018. So I can only really describe my first experience talking to kids in schools about disability as a bit like a calling. At that point, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I'd had previous job experience. I did my year 10, year 11 work experience in the marketing department of the company my dad worked at. That was really awkward, uh, working with my dad. And then I did an internship at uh, a large bank in London, which I won't name, because what that experience taught me was everything I didn't want to do in employment. I tried the London experience. It didn't work for me. People were working hideously long hours for very little personal 
uh, benefit. And it was really my first experience to what we now call uh, diversity and inclusion. I worked on one of their teams there and okay, I, so I really liked it. What would you say were the biggest barriers that you faced, Chris, when you started employment and even today? I think the biggest barrier is perception. It's this belief that someone with a with a physical disability like me must also have an associated learning difficulty. And that's really frustrating. So although there are 13 million people in the UK with disabilities, only 10% of those are wheelchair users. And in reality, what that means is that 90% of those disabilities can be hidden whether it's sensory, uh, someone with long hair, such as yourself wearing a hearing aid so you can't see it, or some other kind of other learning difficulty or perhaps on the autistic spectrum. So many disabilities we don't see. But what I faced was an assumption that because I was a wheelchair user, I was also unable to cope with the workplace. This is Chris in the editing room. I wanted to add a couple of things that I felt were important. The most important barrier that we face, and I've faced it here because I've done it and I'm adding it later on in the editing room, is assumption. I assumed that you would know the definition of disability. And of course you might not. So under the Equality Act 2010, which is the legislation that protects you against discrimination, a disability is a physical or mental impairment. In this case, impairment means the same as disability. And said impairment has a substantial and adverse effect on someone's ability to perform normal day-to-day -day activities like walking, washing, going to the shops, etc. What's really important with this definition is it's quite broad and it does cover mental health. So don't think that if you have mental health issues, you are not covered by this because you are if they are substantial. Also, when recording the interview initially, I focused a lot on my physical disability and didn't share with you that as well as the disability you can see, I also have a disability that you can't see, which is anxiety and depression. So you are not alone and it doesn't stop you from getting the job that you want. You talk about perception um, really clearly. There's, there's still those issues today in terms of some of the challenges that our young people might face. What would mm. you say the difference is between the ideal employment scenario and the reality that our young people are going to be facing in, in 2021? There is still, unfortunately, a fairly huge gap. Um, for me, in the ideal scenario, businesses would be more obviously open about their willingness and desire to have people with disabilities working within their environments. They would plaster their websites with wording like, whoever you are, whatever your background, whatever your disability, we don't care, we want the best candidates. And in many cases, that is actually the attitude that businesses do have or think they project, but in reality, there are still barriers in place to doing it. So my advice to students going into work now is you have to be really, really, really honest about your needs. Rather than assuming the business will automatically make the adjustment that you want, you have to assume they are a bit thick. I hate to say it, and I write a lot of articles about what I wish businesses would do, but in reality, if you want in any employment experience, and this goes right to the initial communication, to the job interview, to an offer of employment, there's lots of young people out there all wanting jobs, and you want to be the one to get that job. Therefore, you need the opportunity to put your best self forward. And if that means you need reasonable adjustment, whether it need, means you need slightly more time for an interview or you perhaps need um, interview material in larger font, whatever your needs might be, you have to tell them. The biggest barrier that we face is that either businesses don't know that their employees have disabilities 
or that people are afraid to tell them. I have to tell you, although you might be afraid to tell a potential employer about your disability, if they cannot cope with your needs at interview, do you really want to work at that place? The answer is you probably don't. And by offering this information to your potential employer and saying, hey, this is what I need to be successful, how they respond to that should also give you a fairly good indicator about whether you want to work in that environment. There are several places where you can go where organisations will facilitate uh, introducing your disability to an organisation, as well as several graduate schemes specifically designed towards people with disabilities. And two websites I would recommend you look at are myplusstudentsclub.com and employability.org.uk. There you will find graduate programs and other bits of useful advice which might help you on your journey towards disclosure and finding the kind of employment that you want. And what's some of the best practice you've seen, Chris? Some of the best practice I've seen is quite literally where businesses are put forward on every email and on their website, we want you to be able to perform at your best. What can we do to make the interview experience better for you? And it's about feeling welcomed. I and many of my colleagues with disabilities have gone into places of work, turned up at the front desk, and the receptionist's face suddenly drains of color because there's someone with a disability there and they don't know what to do or how to behave. You might have arranged a meeting with someone that's very proactive, but ultimately it's the whole business experience. So those businesses that take on disability awareness training, that train all their staff, that allow people to feel comfortable. The best practice I've seen is where there is a culture of disclosure. And I'll give you a little example. When I deliver training, I will often ask, does anybody in the room have a disability that they would be prepared to disclose? And sometimes somebody will put their hand up and say, yeah, I'll tell you, um, I'm dyslexic. And I'll say, thank you for that. Does your line manager know? And the response is normally, oh, God, no. I'll say, well, why not? And they said, well, it doesn't really affect my ability to work. I said, OK, but could you be a better performing employee? Could you do the same amount of work in less hours? Could you get that promotion that little bit quicker? Maybe if you had a screen reader or some other kind of, you know, adaption. The average cost of a reasonable adjustment in the workplace is about £75. It doesn't need to cost a lot of money. But we see disability disclosure rates in the workplace are very low, somewhere between two and a half and eight percent in my experience. And if 20 percent of the population have disabilities, there's a huge gap there. So culture is by far the best thing I've seen businesses work on to make people feel included. And so in terms of recommending what you think our students should be focusing on, if they've got a disability, but even those who don't have a disability, what can they be doing in their search for employment as they develop their careers to make sure that they are holding employers to that inclusive ideal? Oh, that's a, that's a good, tough question. Do your research. Investigate the companies you want to work for. If you're going to go to something like a temping agency, for the love of God, make sure you have told the temping agency your needs. Because although that might turn a few companies off, those are the ones that need training. Those are the ones you don't want to work for. So do your research on the, com on the companies. Nobody knows your disability or your personality or your skill set better than you do. So make sure you put your needs front and centre. I just want to briefly add something here about reasonable adjustments. It doesn't just have to be big, big companies that can do this. Small companies can do it too. There is a government scheme called Access to Work where under the right circumstances, 
the government will provide a grant to modify your workplace in whatever way is needed for you to be a successful employee. So don't think you have to place a huge burden on your employer if the adaptions you require are more on the expensive side. I have a friend who got his car provided for him and modified so that he could drive to work through the Access to Work programme. That is an extreme example but it gives you an idea of the kind of things that can be done. Also, in terms of other adjustments, think what some big companies like Microsoft have done in terms of making environments that are for people with lots of different neurodiverse conditions, for example, adjusting the lighting and other things for those on the autistic spectrum. So much can be done, doesn't have to involve a lot of money, but if it does, access to work can help. And if you were to give one piece of advice to someone watching this interview now who is sat at home or at college and thinking, I don't think I'll ever get a job, I'm not comfortable to disclose my needs, what's your best piece of advice for that young person? My best piece of advice is that you absolutely have to be yourself. I've been through several phases in my life as a young teenager, of course, like everyone, I hated myself, I hated my body, I hated my disability. We've all been through that stage where there's something about ourselves that we don't like. And then I got to the stage where I accepted it and it was okay, it was kind of there, but then ultimately I embraced it. The kind of work I do now, I couldn't do if I didn't have a disability. I would have none of the authority, none of the experience that makes the work I do actually work. But you don't have to have a job that relates to your disability. That's a, that's a choice that I've made. What you do need to do is make sure that you get a chance to put your best foot forward. And if you have needs, then you have to really work hard and get to the part where you feel actually I can tell someone about this because if I do, my work experience becomes better. In law, people cannot discriminate against you. And although nobody wants to use the big stick, the big legal stick, it is there. If you embrace yourself, if you understand yourself and you believe in yourself, as a big cliche that I use, there's no such word as can't. If you believe you can do something, it doesn't matter what your disability, you'll find a way to succeed. But if you're going to be all negative and say, I can't do that, then regardless of ability, you're going to fail. I too thought that, you know, oh, I'll probably never get a job or I'll have a really rubbish job and it'll be really boring. There are so many opportunities out there for you. You don't like any of the jobs that are on offer? Make your own damn job. Run your own business. There, there is this big feeling that there's this set path that everybody must go down. You go from A to B to C, and if you don't do those things, you're a failure. Go away. And that is absolutely not true. There are so many options. For all the bad that COVID has caused, I am offering an interview, I'm talking to you from the other side of the world. I've been delivering disability awareness training to clients from the other side of the world. The opportunities now that this post-Zoom work environment offers probably gives you a great de degree more flexibility than the group before you. So embrace it, embrace yourself and try your very best. Thank you so much, Chris. That has given us all so much to think about. Really appreciate your time. And you are very welcome. I hope everything goes well in Florida. You are very welcome. Um, I wish all of your students the best of luck. Thank you, Chris.